Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here. I hope you're all well. Meaningful Live. We're beginning a series of personalizing and bringing into life the timeless and universal lessons of the Bible in psychological, spiritual, and emotional terms that can empower us all in our lives, no matter what we're dealing with, whether it's challenges, whether it's growth, whether it's areas of pain or areas of pleasure, every aspect of life. So this will be a series, and I welcome you to the series, which every week we'll do another episode. Today I'd like to cover the secret, the secret to personal growth. Three lessons from Abraham. So Abraham may be one of the most well-known characters in all of history. Father of monotheism, the pioneer of ethics and morality. Some attribute to him being the father of modern civilization because he rejected a pagan life and chose a life of service, of selflessness, of giving, of um, virtue, justice, charity, hospitality, values that we all today cherish and we see as the foundations of our very being. But it all began somewhere because he didn't grow up in that type of home. He grew up in a pagan home, in a home of an idol manufacturer. So we're told the story begins, interestingly, in a place that most of us would not look, but carries the real secret to every one of our lives if you truly want to grow. And it's ubiquitous statement right in the beginning of the chapter where it says that God tells Abraham, in Hebrew, lech lecha, go unto you, leave your land, your birthplace, and the home of your parents. And go to the land that I will show you. Doesn't say where, doesn't say what direction. A vague to the land that I will show you. And that's where the entire journey begins. What is the significance of this simple verse? And to even amplify the question of the cryptic nature of this statement, when you give someone directions to go somewhere, they know where they are. You don't have to tell them you're here because the person that point of departure is clear. The focus has to be, where do you want me to go? North, south, east, west? To which country? To which city? To which state? To which street? To which home? To which particular location and here it's reversed when it comes to the destination completely vague the land that I will show you however when it comes to the departure three different seemingly repetitive terms your land your homeland the home of your parents and the place you were born Now, in case of Abraham, all these three are redundant because all three, some people are actually where they live is not where they were born or their home of their parents. But in this case, they were. The land, the place he was born, and the home of his parents were all a particular area in what is today southeastern Iraq. And when it comes to the destination, it's this vague, where the land I will show you. And the answer carries a most powerful message to each one of us. Wherever you want to go in life, whatever goal you have, objectives, you often see that you set out on a journey, you make a plan, a strategy, and I don't only mean physical journey. It can be a spiritual journey, it can be business goals, it can be building a relationship, whatever it may be. And very often you go on the journey, everything seems good, you're inspired, you're motivated, and it just doesn't, doesn't, ca it doesn't catch. Within a few days or a little while later, 
you seem to be stuck. Why? We make resolutions and they don't last. Why? And their answer is not because our objectives are wrong. Sometimes that may be the case. But most often is because we didn't take into consideration the single most important part of any journey. The baggage we carry. The past. Because it's invisible, because it's already the past, we don't necessarily always appreciate how heavy it can be bearing on us. So you can have all the good intentions and all the good inspirations, but if your legs and arms are in chains, even invisible chains, yes, you'll be able to go that far, but the leash is not infinite. At some point, your past is going to tug you back. So the past of our lives, what has shaped and defined us, is single most critical element to free ourselves as much as possible so we can be free to soar and spread our wings and soar and fly anywhere we want to go. So there are three things that we have to keep in mind that can hold us back. They all go into one category, the category of subjectivity. You may have objective goals, you may have great goals, want to conquer new horizons, but we are all subjective beings, which means we have our blind spots, And we have forces that have shaped us. And there are three types of subjectivity, and that's what the verse is referring to. Your birthplace, your homeland, and the home of your parents. And I'll do it in the order of our own chronological growth. The first thing is personal subjectivity. There's a basically natural bias that all of us have. It's called self-love, self-interest, our prejudices and bias based on our own interests, which causes us at times not to be able to see things clearly and <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> clearly and objectively. Now, there's nothing wrong with being subjective. That's how we're born. It's actually healthy because that also means you're going to protect yourself. It's a way of protecting ourselves, is knowing that I have to take care of my own life and my own interests. Where does it become a problem when it colors and distorts your perspective on things? And that's something you need to consider in any journey. Your own blind spots, your own prejudices, your own internal biases, inherent ones. We're not talking about now acquired ones. The second subjectivity comes from parental attitudes. The, birth, the home of our parents, their attitudes, their approach to things, their mindsets, the way they treated us, whether validating or invalidating, criticizing or not criticizing, whatever it may be, it has shaped our psyches. Children are very impressionable. And we will pick up on our parents' approval or disapproval of things. And if it goes to the level of real invalidation or absenteeism or abuse, That will shape you. On a beautiful analogy, it's not beautiful when it's negative, but it's beautiful to understand a child, is like a warm piece of wax, a warm ball of wax. Everything that happens in our childhood makes an impression. So then we grow into adults, and the wax hardens, those impressions harden with it. So that's subjectivity number two that can also impact the way we look at things. Our fears, our insecurities, and other psychological neurosis. And finally, number three, is our land. Social peer pressure. Society exerts a certain amount of demands and expectations of us to fit in. Certain conformity. Nobody wants to stand out. Nobody wants to seem weird or odd. We are affected by others laughing at us or dismissing us. And don't underestimate that effect. That can include also media and other interests inundating us and trying to shape and manipulate our emotions. So there you have three elements that shape and define you that must be considered. So you can have all the best intentions in the world and you set out on a journey, you embark, and you're all ready for it, you're excited. But then things hold us back those invisible subjective forces. Says God to Abraham, 
I want you to become a great human being. And this is God saying to you and to me and to every person on earth. This is a universal, timeless statement. You want to be the best you can possibly be? You need to free yourself of the subjectivity that traps us. This doesn't mean you need to become no longer subject. You need to be aware of it, because awareness is half the cure. Even if parents are excellent parents, we still do not want to live our lives in their shadow and only living up and being an extension of them. We want to become independent individuals. That doesn't mean we don't respect our parents. It doesn't mean we don't honor the past that has shaped you, especially if it's a beautiful past. So this isn't about rejecting. This is about growing and transcending. And actually, very healthy parents, the greatest joy they have is when they see their children spread their wings and grow into adults and productive in their own right. Obviously, with the nurturing and everything that came before. That's even in the best case scenario. And of course, if parents were negative influences, we definitely want to free ourselves. So the focus is on the the point of departure. Look at where you're coming from, because that has shaped you. Just being aware of that frees you to some extent, because then you can do things, take measures to counteract our own blind spots. How do we do that? Let's start with the first subjectivity. You consult. You find a mentor, a friend, someone you can speak to who can somewhat neutralize your own blind spots. How do you counter parental influences? You make yourself aware of them, whether it's through therapy or, again, through friends. What is it that maybe my parents have imposed? I mean, for example, if you have a mother or father that's very fearful, we never took chances, we're always critical, it's going to affect how, you, how your, your self-confidence and self-esteem. Become aware of it and do something to counter it. And finally, social pressure, the same thing. Who are you independent of these forces? Ask yourself that question. If I was not impacted by my, by my society and by my parents and by my own prejudices and biases, what would I be like? That alone is a freeing statement. And sometimes it takes work. So how do we counter social pressures? By separating between you and your society. You are not a product and definitely not a victim of circumstances, of your society, of your parents, or of your own subjectivity. That is the first step knowing that you're not a victim, you're not a product of that, that helps you create and define your own identity. It's not easy, because so much of us have been shaped and defined by our childhoods, by our own subjectivity, by, so, by our educators and our parents, and of course by society. Your opinions, your political opinions, where are they coming from? Is it really your completely independent opinion, or did it come from someone? Someone impressed it upon you, someone convinced you. That's not to say that people can't persuade us, but you need to free yourself from being a slave to someone else's ideas, whoever that person may be. It's sometimes easy just to go along. Someone said, they say, but you want to become free. And that's why the emphasis is not on the destination. The destination will come as a result. Once you have that openness that you're able to challenge your own subjective forces that are affecting you, everything else, the vistas will open up for you. That's why it doesn't say where or go. I will show you to the land I will show you. In addition, you can say to the land that I will show you who you really are. I've asked this question to many people. I ask you this question. You're 20 years old. You're 30 years old. You're 40. You're 80 years old. Here's the question. Who are you? Now, most people just giggle. Who am I? I know who I am. No, let's, let's spell that out. Who are you? Who are you independent of the forces I just described? Let's put aside a personal subjectivity. Who are you if you had different parents or these were not your parents? Who are you if you were living in a different society or society was not tugging at you and shaping your identity? It's not that easy to do, but that's what lech lecha means. To help begin free yourself from other forces that have identified you and who are you on your own. Not what you do, not what you're involved in, not what others have helped define within you, but who are you on your own. So a good place to begin is simply to ask yourself that. Close your eyes, your ears, your taste, touch, and smell. 
What do I feel within? And start saying, what I feel, is that coming from where? Am I just repeating patterns? That every time my mother got angry, my father got angry, I'm doing the same thing they did, I yell, I scream, or I go into silence and I retreat, just as some exa- just basic examples. And you'll be surprised when you open yourself up with these questions, because the question of a wise person is half an answer, and you bring friends and mentors that can help you determine that, you'll suddenly discover parts of yourself you may not even know you had, or you, didn't know you, had, or you may not have the confidence to know that you had to act on. So three lessons from biblical Abraham, which is really the Abraham within each one of us, that any journey you go on, identify the forces that are blocking you. Identify them. Awareness is half the cure. Your own personal biases, parental and other early childhood influences, and society right now exerting itself within, with its own attitudes. And you're guaranteed to find the real you. May you be blessed to discover that part of yourself. Spread your wings. Blossom. Sing the song that's unique to you. Don't die with your song still inside you. As Oliver Wendell Holmes writes in that sad, sad, depressing poem, The Voiceless. Alas to those that die with their song still inside them. Sing your song. Spread your wings. Discover your angel, your flower, the melody, the music within you. And please see me as an asset, an ally to help. This is Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com. Please stay in touch. Contact questions, suggestions, comments, share, like, all the different tools we have today. And above all, be you. You were born an original. Don't become a copy. Thank you.